it's not a fixed uh, thing, the space producer. It's been accompanying me for the last, I think, 20 years as a kind of um, uh, something that intrigues me. I've never considered myself being an architect, but more a space producer. And I will try to elaborate on that uh, during, during the lecture. Um, let's start with um, these two beautiful images, but also two almost painstakingly true images. Um, and on the left side, you see Mr. Gary. I d um, yeah, maybe not everybody is an architect in the, in the room. I'm sorry. Uh, Gary is, is, is like a top architect. Probably he makes this kind of very um, organic, posh buildings for the very rich, for the, very f the, 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 the happy few in the world. Um, so Gary on the left, Flanders on the right. The situation of, of Gary is during a press conference um, asked by an El Mundo journalist uh, what he thinks of people who believe that he makes uh, buildings for um, or creates architecture for show. And this is then the, um, let's say, the reaction of the architect, which I think is um, extremely painful. In a way, the architect becomes mute, has no more words, and becomes very rude as a kind of uh, uh, center of the world, which is extremely um, uh, stupid. But I think for me it's a kind of symbol for one of the problematics which is uh, happening within the, the world of architecture. And on the left we have Flanders as a kind of pass pro toto for, let's say, the Euro Delta, uh, which is uh, an enormously, in a way, congest congested with uh, very little matter. But this very little matter is more or less everywhere and it's sucking out all the energy out of the economy. So um, I would like to address, so the incomes of space producers, the overarching theme, but two sub-themes, the impact and role of the architect, what well, let's call it for the time being the architect, so the one, and for me the architect is both, let's say the architect, but also the urban designer, uh, uh, and actually the architect could be maybe uh, uh, become an, an, an even more uh, broad notion. And on the other uh, side, the impact and role of the policy making, Policy, so not politics, but policy making. Uh, en français, policy. Ah, y a pas de différence en français. Mm, non, parce qu'on peut aussi avoir une policy, uh, private policy, uh, gouvernance. Ouais. Mm. Um, at least these are two subjects which, for me, uh, constitute the essence of uh, um, performing within the architectural realm. If we look at the, um, uh, this is the top 100 of the architects in the world. <coughs> uh, you can find it on the website, uh, or any kind of website. Um, and what's striking is that, so these, these are the companies which are actually building uh, the world around us um, in, to, a, to a quite uh, a high degree. And uh, most of them, I mean, at least I don't know them. I've never heard of them. So. At the, uh, but on, on the other hand, they have this kind of enormous uh, 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 range of, of uh, uh, projects and an enormous impact both on the built world but also on the policy making. So, uh, and of course, when we talk about architecture, at least uh, in my, say, the last 20 years, um, I've always considered myself being on the cultural side of architecture, so the side which gets published and exhibited and all these things. But then I think we have to establish or acknowledge at least that this site is an extremely peripheral site uh, to the uh, activity of architecture. Uh, and I think, I mean, it's worthwhile just to go, not now of course, but go through the list and see how many of these offices that you actually know. And apart from knowing the offices, how much projects that you can uh, link to these offices. Just to put uh, the first one, Nikken Seke, the biggest one in the world, they built, for instance, uh, this is kind of a copy of Huston Bos, which is a, a Dutch town, which is a perfect uh, uh, carbon copy, um, but in Japan, so with hills in the, in the backdrop, uh, and the parking lot on the right side. So it's a kind of uh, uh, park, fair. Um, so this is being built by the biggest company. On the other hand, and some of the slides are in Dutch, I'm sorry for that, but uh, this is a, a scheme which I've been using for the last five, six years on um, uh, PPP, so public-private partnership, which for the last seven to eight years is kind of uh, quite hot if you, I mean, if you're building, there's no escape, there's no way to escape the PPP uh, um, terror in a way. 
And uh, what's interesting, but also frightening again, uh, is to see the position of the architect. So almost the architect is pushed outside of the scheme in the middle of, of course, this kind of uh, very absolute body, um, which is a client. This is a contractor. So the old triangle, in a way, is completely cut up. And so the position of the architect is, is really peripheral. And um, this is a reality. So we have to deal with this reality. I mean, we don't have to moan about it. We have to deal with it. Looking back maybe also to the cultural side, I mean, also there something interesting is happening or something frightening is happening. This is uh, Vals. I mean, probably most of you went to Vals, to the uh, uh, thermal baths of uh, Zumta. This is the thermal baths of Zumta. And this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, m almost two years ago now, there was a, a private competition by the guy who's actually buying the whole hotel complex um, to have a tower within this valley. Each floor has one uh, room, or is one, one apartment or one, yeah, one hotel room. And um, I mean, apart from and Morphosis, the American company, which is, I think, maybe also in this top 100, they actually won it. Um, but what's most striking, I think, is that the jury, which was composed out of, uh, I think, very uh, highly distinguished uh, 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 people, um, very good architects, very good scholars. Uh, at a certain point, they had to distance, distance themselves from, from uh, what the client actually wanted to do, because the client, they gave him uh, the advice and the client did his own thing. Um, so again, even if you're in a jury, even if, let's say, you're the expert, which is actually pairing up with the client, even then, um, your impact is almost zero. Also, interesting to see, interesting to acknowledge. Um, Maybe a last quote um, before we start to build up towards maybe something more positive. Um, by Harry Gugger, former partner of Herzog and Demeron. Uh, he's teaching at the EPFL in Lausanne. And this is an excerpt of one of his uh, last publications. So today, architecture finds itself in the paradoxical situation of being more popular than ever before, while at the same time being exposed to total decline. So we have the both uh, extremities. <coughs> Yet never before have architects had so little influence on the actual work of constructing buildings. So again, I mean, not to moan about it, but we're becoming a kind of exception, some kind of strange exotic species, uh, which from time to time is called upon. Um, if you, I mean, if there's some kind of troubleshooting need needing to be done. But most of the time, uh, the architect as a spatial practitioner, as a spatial um, uh, uh, intelligent form, um, has hardly any kind of social function anymore. I think that's my, I mean, after 25 years of practice, uh, that's more or less my synthesis. So we have to work on this. Uh, one of my uh, uh, all-time favorites, Perret, in his uh, Contribution à une théorie de l'architecture, the first page, mobile ou immobile, tout ce qui occupe l'espace appartient au domaine de l'architecture. I think I've, I've never, this is for me the, I've never read one sentence on architecture, let's say the potential meaning and impact and relevance and urgency of architecture that is so uh, precise, meaning that everything could belong to this realm of architecture. It is not architecture, so it's not equal to architecture, but it belongs to this realm of architecture. And like Benoit said, I t currently I teach uh, in London. So every week I pass by Lille, um, so Eura Lille, uh, which you probably all know as a kind of, let's say in the 90s, this kind of Uber pro project, uh, this kind of uh, super macho project, um, which personally, when I, at least in, in the train, when I drive by it, it's, it's kind of, um, looks kind of dilapidated. Uh, and not so maybe uh, successful as it was uh, intended to be. But um, this, so this was w and one moment I was looking outside and then I looked down. Um, um, and let's say this moment and uh, the basket, um, uh, I, all of a sudden I was wondering why, in a way, architecture is also the basket and the architecture. And um, again, I think this is one of the feeble points of architecture that because there is no social position, no societal position anymore, the architecture is literally pushed outside towards this kind of facade. Uh, uh, and the architect has the impression that he or she is the master of the facade, which is of course uh, a hoax. 
Um, another example, uh, Ricciotti, Ricciotti, Ricciotti uh, in Marseille. Um, and then you get this, um, uh, this is uh, Le Monde. C'est le soleil qui dicte la construction. I don't think that's true, but uh, so you get this kind of uh, made, made up uh, uh, argumentation. But also, this is in match, Paris match, uh, archi provocateur. So again, so we're, we're pushed into this corner, um, uh, which is completely not a central position, uh, which is not a networked position within the societal realm. Um, and I mean, if he's glad with this kind of uh, denom denomination, archi provocateur, it's good for him, but I think it's completely uh, unnecessary and uninterested. Um, I started in 95. Um, my career at uh, Luc Deleu, top office in Antwerp, who's actually not an architect, well, he studied architecture and he graduated as an architect, but he's actually an artist. This is one of his uh, undemanded for projects for uh, uh, Gare Europe Centrale in Brussels, which is a station uh, um, hanging in the sky. But if we talk about research by design, to, for me, Luc, um, what he did uh, over the last 30, 40 years, um, maybe through the lens of apparently this artistic uh, practice, but in a way, again, he was pushed in this corner of artistic practice because nobody saw him as a real architect. But what he did avant la lettre was research by design in a way, um, at least, uh, let's say, for Belgium or Benelux or Western Europe. Uh, it's one of the few people I know who actually was so engaged in uh, a very specific architectural uh, research uh, by this uh, design. And what's more striking is that, um, I don't know if you know, preemptive means that, I mean, even before the question is asked, so he was actually asking the question, uh, often a question that nobody wanted him to ask. Um, uh, so it becomes annoying, it becomes kind of friction. Uh, uh, and I mean, that was my, I mean, I consider him to be my master in that sense. Although when you're um, uh, uh, 23, 24, uh, it's an extremely difficult thing to grasp this uh, preemptive research by design. But by now I think I've, I've grasped that is, I think the only way that we can actually um, recalibrate the architectural or the spatial profession is to become more preemptive and to produce more things which are not demanded for, so that they become a real question and a real demand. So, not that we have to become a client, that's something else, but I think we should be able to ask these questions. Um, I'm not going to show any projects of the office, so rest assured, but I'm just showing something. Um, so, after Luc Deleu and some other things, uh, we started the office, and this is in 2002 when. Um, extremely young and uh, maybe not enough work. So we had time in a way to be preemptive, to ask questions which were not asked for. This was at the time when we were making the first book and we wanted to have, let's say, a bigger project within the book. So we imagined, uh, it's an imaginary project, of course, no client. Um, hello. Um, it was a project for a high rise on the canal I think more or less upside is now, I think, more or less the right uh, thing. Could be, it's more or less the same location. Um, but uh, this project, which was undemanded for actually, and I'm not going to explain the whole uh, tra trajectory, uh, ended up in the fact that we uh, um, arrived in Albania, of all places. Um, and that uh, at least starting this vertical thing here in the background, which took us 10 years to build, which is now finished, which is going to be finally shown on the Venice bi Biennial. At the same time, being shown on the Venice Biennial is almost like shooting it uh, in the head, I find. But that's maybe also a discussion for afterwards. So the fact that it's actually within the city uh, escape is, I think, the most important part. Um, but we started out in Albania through this preemptive exercise uh, somebody saw us said, well, I'll invite you over, well, we, we won a competition, a lot of work, but more importantly, um, after that we became a kind of confidant uh, of some politicians, some policy makers, um, and we started to engage ourselves pro bono uh, within policy making. So we started to 
not think about architecture or as architects about architecture, but how can we actually use architecture as a means for a city which back then and even still now, back then was completely was like a ruin. I mean, after all the crises that they had uh, had gone through. And I'm, I'm quite proud to say that after 10 years of this kind of pro bono, in a way it, it crystallized in something which you can see, I think, at the end of the month, the uh, uh, Rotterdam Biennial is opening. And one of the ateliers uh, will be Atelier Albania. Albania. So let's say from a, a tiny, well, not tiny, but a singular architectural project, we gain some confidence within this policy and political realm. Um, not being instrumentalized by the politicians, but becoming this kind of uh, table partner. And step by step, we actually arrive to, to uh, make them open up to the possibilities of architecture. So not because you could say, well, this tower is the kind of bling-bling potential, although it's not. I can assure you it's not. I mean, it's built with very few means. And But we managed... Um, maybe on a very, very um, local level to actually open up this whole uh, envelope. And by now, in for the Rotterdam Biennial, they uh, organized different competitions, and they also actually started to use uh, the instruments, and I'm, tonight I'm going to talk about the instruments that actually enable research by design. I'm not going to talk about research by design as such, but the instruments and the environments that are needed to actually perform architecture, uh, research by design. Uh, they also took over some of the instruments that I, as a biomaster, tried to uh, develop with the team. So in a way, uh, what we're going to see uh, at the end of the month in, uh, in Rotterdam is a kind of strange coming together of um, a couple of, uh, let's say, practices in a way. A private practice, a public practice, uh, the biennial itself, which, I, again, I think you know, I hope you know, the biennial is a fantastic uh, uh, vehicle for research by design, uh, but not seeing architecture or the spaces as a final product, but really as a means uh, to um, whisper, uh, or like to become a kind of policy whisperer. So uh, we encountered in, in Albania this, this like, I mean, if, if in Flanders they're building 160 schools there, they needed like 400 schools. So everything was like tripled. If uh, uh, the waste management, I mean, which was a disaster, because all these things have spatial outcomes or spatial effects. So we thought at least that it was our place to actually try to intervene within this potential preemptive policy making. And for instance, this is a project which was uh, for the uh, Vlora Coastal Development, won by one of the competitions won by uh, Xavier de Geiter, which is, I think, going uh, somewhere soon. Tom, you know? No? Um, uh, Tom worked uh, on the tower, uh, uh, and Emmanuel worked on the square. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, but again, more importantly, all of a sudden you see these kind of strange, so the, the small hands which you saw here all of a sudden become a kind of logo, I mean, uh, for what it's worth. But the idea of Atelier Albania, so all of a sudden, not only a city, but a country. And the thing is that the guy you see standing at the Rama was, at the time of the tower, the mayor. Now he's the prime minister. So he took with him this uh, ambition, but also this knowledge uh, to the to the higher level. And the woman sitting next to her, Eglantina uh, uh, Germini, uh, she was bombarded into Minister of um, uh, Spatial Development uh, two years ago with no uh, knowledge whatsoever on the subject. So it was like, blank uh, uh, minister. So she contacted uh, the Biennial of Rotterdam to have input. She came to my atelier as a Baumeister to have input, which we gladly gave because I think it's about exchange. I mean, that's part of also the, the public force. So I also I went to uh, the last Biennial of Rotterdam and there I presented these three instruments, the, uh, the open call, which I'm not going to really talk about. But in a way, it was... A, it also potentially, ha or it has the potential of being researched by design, but the problem is that architects always make it into an architectural uh, uh, design. That's uh, a pity. Uh, the pilot projects and Laboramte, for which we didn't find any good translation, so it's Laboramte. It's, um, um, and gladly, I mean, this book is now coming out, so The Metab Metabolism of Albania, which is not a book full of blah, blah. 
It's a book full of real projects, real urgencies, real procedures which are uh, taking place. Um, and um, I mean, some of you know me and know also how the Baumeister ended, which was by I got I was uh, I was fired uh, by the minister or by the the uh, which is something uh, juridical and I'm not going into. Um, but at the same time that this is going on uh, in Flanders, this is also going. I'm not the one to show my face, but I have to. This is an article uh, that uh, Bourgeois, so the, now the prime minister, uh, actually called me in and said, "What well, actually? What are you doing there in Albania with the uh, Atelier Baumeister? Because this is not belonging to our sphere of influence. So you, what what is happening?" And this was actually the beginning of uh, getting fired. Uh, I'm not going, but the the, the thing I actually misjudged, um, uh, and I'm going to give a very open lecture, so a very honest lecture. I saw Flanders as being part of the Euro Delta, and they saw Flanders as being this thing with a hole in the middle, um, being Brussels, um, and this was truly a misjudgment of my, my part. But nevertheless, we continued working on on this uh, right picture. Um, and maybe briefly, for those who, who don't know the uh, uh, history of the Baumeister, so the state architect, government architect, uh, it started in, in 1999 with uh, Bob Farid. Uh, the minister on the right, uh, Svivina de Meester, she was back then in charge for uh, a certain uh, portefeuille, which enabled her to install the Flemish Baumeister as a copy of the Dutch one. Uh, and even Bob Farid, so the open oproep, the open call, is a copy of a Dutch procedure. So in a way, the first five years were kind of very intelligent, must I say, very intelligent copy-paste of what was going on in, in Holland. And what we also saw that was that the open call in Holland it disappeared and uh, it continued in, in Flanders. And of course, this open call produced, I think, very interesting, very good and urgent projects. Um, <coughs> some of them, these maybe are bigger ones. And this is, let's say, uh, uh, after 15 years, there are 600 projects of which 253 on the built or being built, which I think in itself is an, uh, an interesting momentum. But what we also saw, um, so when we, this is Bob Farid, this is Marcel Smets, this is uh, my five years. So at the beginning, there was this kind of enthusiasm, uh, public bodies, cities, they said, oh, it's interesting. We don't have to pay the architects a lot, so uh, it's cheap as well. Um, and then we got this um, less enthusiastic. This was, uh, there were a lot of schools all of a sudden, these, these two pikes. Um, and when we started, we still have this kind of uh, backlash of this enthusiasm. But then very quickly, this is the crisis more or less, so the crisis. Uh, very quickly, the whole thing collapsed. So the open call because there were no more public clients. There was apparently no more public money and PPP, public-private partnerships, entered into the game. So we thought, well, we have to find solutions because, uh, and this was also one of the biggest critiques that we, or at least I got was, well, he's not interested in the open call. I was of course interested in the open call, but this was not the Valhalla of uh, architectural design and even architectural research because also within the open call, there were a lot of research projects. Uh, so we had to find new uh, models, and again, models linked to this thing, the Euro Delta. This is where Flanders belongs. The Euro Delta is one of the three biggest deltas in the world, economically speaking, but probably nobody really knows what's going on. And also, on a spatial point of view, there are hardly any kind of evidence of, the, of that kind of thing. So uh, this was my client, the Flemish government on the left. These are all the ministers. And uh, this is 2010, so uh, the, the previous uh, government. <coughs> and the way they worked was almost, uh, well, often is in a kind of troubleshooting manner. So there's a problem, then we're going to solve the problem. But often there is, there is no kind of, uh, again, preemptive uh, visionary talk. So this happens, and then we're going to solve it. Um, uh, the catch-up policy, so uh, for instance, in housing and in schools, uh, They've now established that they have a kind of backlog, so they have to have a kind of catch-up policy. But catching up means that you're already too late. Means that other forces actually can actually uh, intervene. Um, I'm going to show the pilot projects in Laboramte 
soon, but uh, please still keep with uh, uh, also the, the the PPP and the debudget debudgeting uh, uh, policy, which was uh, quite uh, uh, present. Well, it's going to keep, but especially also this, this ant antagonism. So every square kilometer of Flanders, there are at least two or three different parties. For instance, uh, the the farmers or the green guys who are actually fighting for the same kind of square kilometer. So everybody's fighting for the same bit and piece of of, uh, of land. So there is no real policy on that level and. When I started in 2010, of course, we had the open call. This was like maybe one day a week of work. <coughs> so what to do for the f four other days? And also uh, what struck me was that none of these people were our clients. So we were working with uh, cities, we were working with very local bodies, but on a super, super level, nobody was actually a client. So uh, we wrote uh, an ambition statement, which was called Seven Memos for an enlightened building culture. And within this statement, there were three main points which were not very explicit, but um, horizontal policy, pilot policy, and preemptive policy. And I still believe, even six years later, that these three uh, ingredients are crucial uh, for um, uh, success. Horizontal policy, uh, and again, this is in Dutch, I'm sorry, but these are all the uh, so mobility, uh, 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 farmland, um, social affairs, and we were located within this zone. Um, so we have 12, no, 13 departments, and we were located in this. This is internal affairs, which was a very strange uh, environment to be to be in. This is uh, spatial development, so we were not there. We were somewhere else, and of course, I mean, if if we're really serious about the whole thing, um, I mean, because every decision that is made sooner or later lands in real space. So you better have a plan for these kind of decisions to, to incorporate them uh, uh, within your uh, spatial vision. So the thing we tried to do for five years, which didn't work, I mean, we uh, was to actually be f make a new horizontal department uh, with all the intelligence of the different other departments, so the best guys and the best uh, girls from all these departments and put them in this kind of super uh, department. So this didn't work, but it, it worked for like 10%, but I think it's still something is extremely important. Then maybe the, the core, core argument of this lecture, the pilot policy, <coughs> how to address these, these ministers, um, I mean, where to start? Uh, and of course, the only reason or the only way that they actually would react was if you would address them on their level of responsibility. So I started with one guy, uh, Jo van Deurze, who I knew a bit, but not very much, um, and who was actually the minister for uh, care, um, to health care. And it actually took me only five minutes, because you only have five minutes with a minister, um, uh, to walk in and walk out with uh, a big wallet of uh, money, uh, uh, an extra uh, employer, and the guarantee that we can actually test for five projects in five years' time. I'm going to explain this later on. Then we uh, went to the housing minister. It took us three months to convince uh, her. We did the schools. Uh, we did the productive landscape uh, with the uh, prime minister. Uh, the Blackfields and the arts. So we had uh, six out of nine ministers who actually, in the end, uh, said, well, we're interested because it costs it, it cost money. I mean, they had to give us money uh, so that we can actually start working or have people working for us. And in the end, what we did also was we, we put out these very small brochures at every step of the way. So on, on collective housing, for instance, the uh, invisible care, productive landscape. Um, and how did it work? So what I asked them was, give us five years. We'll, fi we'll build five projects. It doesn't seem a lot, but five projects which actually get the okay of the minister to go outside of legislation. So they could uh, do things that normally, from a legislation point of view, you can't do. I will explain this also later on. Uh, and the idea was to uh, uh, extract from the whole process five major uh, legislative changes. So use architecture to change legislation. Step one, theme exploration. So we had six months, for instance, in the healthcare, so we took the best uh, 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 experts, the best also architects, 
we had them in, in a room for six months and they actually made up this kind of uh, super synthesis of what the biggest challenges were in this thematic, for instance, in housing or in care. I'm going to show you two traje traje trajectories uh, later on, which will be housing and, and uh, healthcare. Second, um, what we, uh, three lures, package of three lures or three um, attractors, because we had to attract real clients. Right? So the idea was to actually have real clients who, who would step into the program. So one was that they got a budget, an extra budget to make, with of course uh, experts, a master plan. Um, and that they also were um, guided by project directors the whole, whole process. Second one, thematic benefits. For instance, in healthcare, what, I mean, normally you have a very long waiting list. What we did, well, we put them on top of the list. It works as a charm. I mean, all of a sudden we had like, everybody wanted to be on top of the list to have his first subsidies. It's very interesting. Also very interesting that the minister is, is prepared to do so. And then three, uh, what I call the regulations, shelter means that, um, I mean, if the building permit would be handed in, that we would facilitate um, the okay of the building permit. And that, um, three, then there would be an open call by the minister to potential clients. Uh, and normally we had like 40 clients per uh, uh, trajectory. Four, choose of, choice of five candidates, uh, which was done very open and very democratic way, but also choice of five architects. So in the mean, in meanwhile, also architects could uh, uh, put in a, an offer, start a master vision and then develop and build the project. Um, of course, these five years was a kind of euphemism knowing that it would be at least seven years. I think most of the projects are now still being built. Um, it takes a bit longer. But what's really interesting is that in the meanwhile, the feedback to legislation, for instance, in the healthcare trajectory, we immediately started with uh, finding these innovations which were offered by the architects, uh, uh, demanded by the client, but offered by the architects, and put them into legislation. This is a very painstakingly long process to change legislation. So you have to start very early on. Um, but I'm very proud also that to say that we actually managed to use architecture to change things for at least the coming decades so that people, other clients afterwards, other public bodies afterwards, could actually benefit from these five pilots. Um, in healthcare, and I'm gonna show you a couple of them, not all of them, um, we had these five. Um, Going to start with one which was in Sintrade. It's this kind of big, very central location. Uh, and this was the proposal. Um, I'm not going into detail because that's not so interesting for this uh, talk. But what we managed to do here was to disconnect the typology of the dwelling, the healthcare dwelling, uh, with the type of healthcare that is provided. So we get this kind of almost generic model. Um, Again, maybe something for a talk afterwards, but this is like uh, a major shift within legislation in uh, in the healthcare because everybody's looking like me, like, what's he talking about? With the uh, um, second one, which is Dilbeek, uh, which was a private investor who actually earned his money and he wanted to invest this back into the uh, social fabric. Uh, the Val de Vintailleur made this uh, proposal with a couple of different typologies of uh, housing and uh, healthcare. Um, and I think here it was very important also in the, in the previous one that the architectural imagination, although we know for sure this will never look like this, this will never be built literally like this, but very early on in the process already have these kind of apparently concrete uh, pictures and ideas, and visualizations and potentials uh, on the table works uh, as a charm. Um, and here, for instance, I think the, the big gain was that uh, the private sector, which is a, let's say, uh, private sector and healthcare, it's a booming business. But it's a booming business in the sense that the quality is, is dropping dr drastically because they have to earn money, the private sector, when they invest into healthcare. Um, so here we actually managed to make a project where we had a, a very um, good equilibrium between profit, but also social profit. Another one where uh, we had these uh, kind of uh, uh, old, but I mean, this couldn't be torn down. <coughs> Tom Tess, who actually in invented an architecture, which will be built or was being, being built. 
but the main topic here was well how to work with these uh, 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 listed buildings normally in healthcare they say well listed buildings uh uh we're not we're not going there because it's too expensive uh, uh, to use them and also here in on, on a very um, beautiful subtle level we actually managed also to incorporate these things and to make sure that the integration of uh, historical uh, uh, heritage is actually becomes facilitated within healthcare sector so now I say in, in one or two years time you will have legislation where if people want to actually put a, a healthcare program within a building which is maybe not really meant for healthcare they will get this kind of uh, uh, advantage advantage uh, uh, policy and the last one in this one is when bef just before you die um, this is a kind of vacuum within uh, uh, legacy um, but this was NOAA architects who uh, actually offered kind of a conglomerate, a very intelligent one, but also a very beautiful and, and almost poetic one where they worked on things like lying, sitting, being. But more importantly, also there we actually showed that the centralization of this uh, program, again, if you don't know all the details, it looks very um, maybe abstract, but again, this is a kind of uh, extreme big shift within legislation that things can actually be, be centralized and that, I don't know how, how to, exp to uh, translate, Zorg continuum, so that you actually offer a kind of continuous care all along is actually guaranteed and also that the architecture is reflecting this. In the um, pilot projects for collective housing, and again, uh, Flanders at least has no tradition whatsoever in collective housing. Everything is uh, uh, individually, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, let's say, almost in their DNA. Um, so, so how to promote collective uh, uh, housing and also there we try to put and I'll, I'll go through it uh, uh, very quickly we try to in this first six months we try to find thematics which are challenging enough for instance this one CLT um, which exists I think in America for three decades and this is actually the very first uh, uh, a CLT project uh, 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 in Flanders. CLT means that you actually disconnect the property of the land and the property of the building, which has a lot of profits, uh, but also uh, for the community. And which also means that you can actually drop uh, uh, the cost uh, dr dramas dr uh, dramatically. So in this case, for instance, the CLT was really like a I call a hyper-social uh, public surface. So it was like for the very poor uh, people to uh, be able to live nevertheless in a very uh, good and comfortable and generous way. So um, Collectif Nord made this kind of master plan. Uh, again, uh, here I heard that the project in a way was stopped but taken over by AWB, so Architecture Workroom Brussels which in a way is also a possibility, I think. So it can actually grow into of via other ways. Uh, uh, so it will happen, but it, it's not through the bomb mister. It's okay, I think. As a, um, other project in Bevere, and this was a very big uh, discussion within the public administration uh, and also the cabinet of uh, the Minister of Housing. Um, we decided to open up the call also for private parties. Uh, so not only public bodies, but also private parties. And Matexi, you know Matexi? Um, the king of, at least the king of Flanders. Um, and now of Brussels, I think I see them everywhere. Um, Matexi owns this land, or still owns this land, and this was owned by uh, uh, a public body. Um, and uh, this is categorized as an expansion territory for housing. Although, uh, I mean, all, all the ecological indicators say no. So it's flooding, it's all these things. Um, and we said, uh, so with the uh, steering com committee, we said to the administration, let's, let's take Matexi on board. So let's take the devil on board. Um, let's take the devil on board and ask them to actually work through open book uh, logic so that they actually had, had to show, let's say, the way they calculate profits, which they did, I think, for 
not for the full 100%. But nevertheless, it was, I think, a very, on the one hand side, it was very interesting to see that the administration said, like, my taxi, no, 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 this is like a step too far. Which is in a way a stupid reaction because Mataxi again looking at this list of hundred biggest architecture firms, they're doing all all the big jobs in a way. Mataxi is very powerful. So I mean imagine if you could uh change Mataxi's view on things for five percent, it would have an enormous uh, impact also uh, on other uh, uh uh private partners. And I think we managed that to do this five percent at least. But also to work together and to not see it as two parcels, but to becoming like one uh, potential uh, territory for development. Taking into account, this is the Ferraris uh, chart, um, this almost very natural uh, scale of the territory, more or less one hectare for the, the old fields. Similar to, for instance, Cambridge, all these rooms. Um, and uh, Bovenbau, who started this project, um, actually proposed, I think, a very intelligent and very subtle way of introducing quite a lot of housing. Uh, but all the, housings, all, all the housing uh, 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 units are collective, having this kind of imagination. At, at first sight, you might think, well, it's not that spectacular as a jump. At the same time, when you see what normally what, 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 what Taxi offers on their website, and you see this, this is like, again, landslide. Um, and this is going through. Um, another project, uh, which I'm not going to show in detail, um, this was somewhere in Flanders, let's say, and uh, all these terrains were owned by four different parties. And for the last 10 years, they these, because they, want, they also they want to develop the, 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 the territory, so the, I mean, there's all these beautiful green spots, uh, in a way. Uh, and you, as you can see, this cake is completely divided up to these uh, parties which were quite antagonistic, uh, so they were not really working together. Uh, so 10 years of nothing. And then they were, they, 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 um, uh, when the call was, was launched, they were candidate. And we picked them because we, we were challenged by this impossibility, in a way. And the first thing we did was um, not to make a design, or have a design made, was actually work for six, seven months with a lawyer. With a lawyer who actually could offer uh, a, a land bank logic. So it means that land bank, you know land bank? Land bank means that um, we make an abstraction of all the property lines, so it becomes one big bowl. Then the thing gets developed, and again, in a way, let's say the profit gets equally divided over all the, over all the parties. Again, apparently it doesn't seem like something spectacular but in this case i mean with a thing which was lasting for at least 10 years was solved in in six months and then the design could start um interesting that you first need again this this uh this idea of the law to to uh, break open a, a trajectory a last last project on the on the pilot projects um somewhere in antwerp in a way prototypical with the ag vespa um, some kind of block, let's say, with this uh, uh, residual green patch uh, in, in the middle. A green patch that uh, even was cut through by, by uh, a very busy street. And of course, uh, all the inhabitants here, although this green patch, I mean, it didn't mean anything. It was used by maybe some kids, but actually, it w because it was so dilapidated, nobody really wanted to go there. But as soon as uh, the authorities wanted to have a densification, and so to build there, there was a protest. Um, so how can you have or av avoid a protest, still develop there, and still allow for the fact that they could actually have green space? Um, so this is a terrain. Uh, this was a proposal. So the block within the block, this is done by office uh, and Bart Verschaffel. Uh, so this is the addition. These are the existing, uh, uh, the existing tissue, um, making sure that we could add 150 extra units, but actually also have a kind of extra value, because all this residual green terrain become became something of a destination. So in the middle, a very specific park uh, environment. Uh, on the sides, these kind of uh, uh, small uh, gardens. 
And it was also interesting that in the process, all of a sudden, the school which was here was interested in having a bit of this. Can we have a bit of this? We, we got this question. Can we be part of this? Next, uh, uh, somebody was interested in having healthcare uh, development. Can I please join? So starting from a protest action, offering a design, again, which in itself is maybe not that, I mean, of course, it's a master plan, so it's not architecture. <coughs> uh, but it, I think it's quite uh, intelligent and is very specific, let's say, also in its dimensions. Can actually all of a sudden create uh, uh, a coalition of the willing. So both for the, uh, the people who are living there, but also for new partners. And then thirdly, so this is the pilot. I mean, I think in the last five years we did 30 pilot projects almost may maybe also as a kind of compensation for the open call, which was like diminishing. I think the 30 pilot projects, maybe of which maybe, let's say 20 will go on. Not all of them uh, succeeded. Um, but we got the, uh, uh, I think just uh, at the beginning of 2015, we got uh, uh, Joe van Deurze, the first minister, who said, I want the second generation of uh, pilot projects for the healthcare sector. And that's also what we wanted. It becomes a kind of generation after generation. And that, let's say, maybe in 20 years' time, when a new government is installed, they say, well, where are my pilot projects? I need my pilot projects to assure my policy or the intelligence kind of uh, within my pol policy making. But of course, we still had three left who didn't want to do any kind of pilot projects, because we all offered them pilot projects. And, uh -uh. Um, and just also to offer you an insight, I mean, uh, so this is, uh, was the Minister for Infrastructure, this was my Minister, f uh, was for um, Heritage, but also for um, uh, uh, Brussels Serant. Um, and uh, uh, the guy was in charge for uh, uh, spatial development. So, I mean, let's say those ministers who actually were potentially the core ministers would say, like, uh -uh, no pilot projects, thank you. Um, so how can we, again, could we break, break open this kind of envelope of, of potential? And just to, I mean, I, I tried first this one, uh, matters. Um, so uh, I, I organized an interview, a double interview with him. Um, and within this interview, uh, this was in the moment of uh, ambition of a territory in Venice and in Antwerp. Um, so it, it was about the future of Flanders and, I mean, the fact that Flanders had to uh, innovate itself completely. And in some, some way during the uh, presentation or during the interview, the minister got really enthusiastic. So, uh, and even his spokesman was sitting next to him. So in a way, he was there to check that the minister couldn't say something which would, I mean, he couldn't say. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, and I, I mean, I partially maybe whispered in, it, it into his ear, but I, he said like, well, if you decide as a person that you want to live outside the city, you will have to pay more. You have to pay more taxes. Because, I mean, you need sewage, you need more road infrastructure. Um, and often, let's say, that the rich people can actually afford to live outside the city, where, I mean, we're, we're back in like 100 years ago, where the city becomes this kind of socialist melting pot of the poor whereas uh, the rich are living outside of the city. So he said, I, I, you're Dutch, afgelegen wonen moet duurder worden. So if you live uh, outside the city, you will have to pay more. Interesting. Of course, he said it as a kind of in-between sentence and it became the, the headline. This was uh, October 9, 2012. October 10, 2012, in the parliament, he got shot, let's say. Well, not literally, but by the opposition, especially by the Catholics, because, I mean, that's their clientele. Everybody is living uh, next to a, a pasture. Or, or field. And then October 11, 2012, there was a press release saying that it won't get more expensive. So in, in a period of 48 hours, you get tuck, tuck. Um, and of course, it looks funny, and, but at the same time, it's, it's dramatic. Because these are the guys uh, who are policy makers. These are the politicians who have to have the vision in a way and uh, make sure that their administration, their cabinet, their administration, and all the powers underneath that actually um, go through with uh, this kind of innovation. Um, so this is quite uh, uh, interesting. <clears throat> also in, in this uh, ambition note, which I showed you earlier on in 2010, I had this uh, very stupid uh, drawing included, uh, which I drew myself. Uh, 
um, but it had the intention of being almost stupid, stupidly simple or not serious almost. But um, the idea was so again you have Flanders. Um, we were very interested in these borders, so Lille, uh, the coast. In a way, this is a symbol for the Euro Delta, Antwerp, Rotterdam, uh, the Vlaams Rand rond Brussel, um, and uh, something here, uh, the Euro region. But we were not sure yet. And so, in, potentially, we, again, we had five programs f with no clients. Nobody asked for this. I mean, no client whatsoever. On the contrary, for instance, for the coast, we got a lot of protests. So they're like. It, it's not your thing to 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 intervene on, on on this kind of level, and in a way they were right. But nevertheless, so the co this was the minister for the coast. Uh, this was the guy also in charge for energy. So we found something of energy here, and uh, bourgeois for uh, uh, Brussels uh, and Flanders. And what we did was we actually in 2012 we we pushed them a bit, uh, uh, claiming uh, the Venice Biennial Pavilion, which was. Um, to my, I mean, let's say visually, maybe not the most uh, interesting pavilion ever, for sure. But for us, there was a, a complete, let's say, political uh, agenda underneath this um, to make sure that, well, apparently the public uh, outside of Flanders and Belgium is interested in this condition. Why aren't you? And that worked quite well. So sometimes you also have to abuse cultural uh, manifestations uh, for political reasons. Uh, we did a kind of copy then also in uh, Antwerp, in the single. And um, so we started first with the uh, 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 the coast, which of course you know, which grew, which I think is like almost like a first stage of development, but not a final stage of development. I think it's very, I mean, everybody think it's finished, it's full, it's, it's not. This is, I mean, you could, quite easily turn, tear down a, a lot of things. And then um, we started um, with a lot of parties because the coast, I mean, it's, we had this kind of enormous list of stakeholders, like impossible to take uh, into account. But we started to invite them bit by bit, e each time in Ostende, so with the, uh, seeing the, the sea. Um, and gradually, at first they were very reluctant, uh, gradually they actually liked to come to these sessions. And at first also there was no design, so it was just like listening to them, seeing that. Um, and gradually uh, people from uh, um, uh, HNS, for instance, uh, it's a Dutch company who's actually uh, really uh, doing intelligent stuff about with uh, uh, water uh, ecology. Lines were starting to get drawn. Uh, they took uh, the thing. I'm, I'm not so into uh, what's it called? It's kind of grassroots participatory thing. I don't believe in it personally, which is not news for you, for some of you. Um, well, I, I don't believe in it as, let's say, the Valhalla of, of uh, newness or, or of uh, innovation. It's maybe a small um, way of going about. But I do believe in having this kind of pressure cooker environment where, I mean, in a way, they get the feeling that they are seen as some, some like somebody. Uh, uh, um, I mean, they, they understand we listen to them. They understand they have some kind of autonomy. At the same time, they, they're not going to draw it. Uh, I think that's a very big difference. And then we had uh, a team working on it. Uh, this was also partially Xavier de Geter. Uh, maybe slightly redoing his Monaco uh, project, but um, he did f four scenarios, uh, proposed four scenarios. None of them were reasonable as such. None of them were intended to be built as such, of course. But each <coughs> of these scenarios put out a question, I mean, which like, uh, for instance, this one, and this was, uh, unfortunately, this one was picked up by the press, where we would say, well, I mean, view, if you look at the ecology and, and the topography of the coast, um, and you would have this uh, a big storm coming up, uh, ideally this was, would, would, is what would happen. I mean, this, this is lower as, as such, so it could actually flood. And maybe we should, let's say, in a period of 100 years, 
reinvest, let's say, in, in the place which is more or less secure without having to put a wall all over. <coughs> of course, this is uh, oil on the fire, which it was. So we had this thing, well, Belgian coastline to be split in half and all of these things. So again, what we, what we encountered was, um, because it, it went too, too, too early on to, uh, to the public media, this was not our intention, it was also not our action, but they got hold of it in some way, and then the media started to play with it, of course, annulling it completely. Um, nevertheless, I, I think even still now, uh, the whole atelier for the coast is still running, and it's now getting smaller areas, so not the whole, and also it was never the intention to make a master plan for the coast, but at least you have to show that the coast could have a kind of ecology of its own, I mean, that's, that has a potential. Um, but then you have to dare to make choices, of course. And it's now trickling down into an atelier where, uh, let's say, every coastal com community ha will have its project. Uh, but again, I think the most important part is that there will be now a culture of debate, not only of debate, but also of making projects. And I'm really glad that we made this very stupid drawing at the beginning, um, because I think for the first time in a way, from an official point of view, the coastline is, is put into question. Um, this is a book which came out very recently. Um, I started Metropolitan Landscapes, I wasn't able to finish it, uh, so I have a very dubious relationship with it, but I'm never, nevertheless I want to show you, uh, because I think it's a very important, it was a very, and it still is a very important momentum, because I think for the very first time, um, you can't see it, but this is like Brussels and Flanders and all the parties involved which have some kind of power or legis legislation power. Um, I think for the f first time, together with the Brussels Baumeister, Olivier Bastin, we managed from our um, obje ob objective position, we managed to get not only these people around the table, we managed to get money for them to be able to study. Uh, and we managed also to get some kind of signatures um, and some kind of also involvement all along the, in, uh, into the process. Um, so not just giving money and then uh, not being interested. What we did here was, again, it's, it's always the same kind of tactic, of course, selecting a couple of areas. It's nothing new, this. This is like, uh, you're now having this, uh, the northern um, uh, hemisphere of Brussels, Flanders being also part of this kind of atelier. So it's nothing new, um, but I'm sure that at least one of those four uh, will have some kind of uh, uh, true effect. And also what was, I think, quite new here, at least for Flanders, um, for Brussels, can't tell, but was that the idea of open space, metropolitan landscape, the idea of landscape, so open space. So not the build, but the thing which is happening here in between, the kind of residual space, uh, became actually the uh, red thread within the whole exercise. So the idea was actually to have the green people around the table, and the green people were not the protesters, but they were really, in a way, the clients uh, uh, around the table. Which, at least in Flanders, is quite, uh, quite um, new. So we had, for instance, uh, uh, the Vallée de la Seine, I'm not going into detail. I will show this because uh, this is, of course, one of these uh, outcomes. It's by uh, Witt. Um, and the idea behind the project is extremely intelligent. Um, I still feel that when I see these kind of drawings, we're not there yet in the visual language to communicate the intelligence. That's my... So if we talk about research by design, Let's say also my kind of, now I'm going to the end, so I'm, it's my commentary, uh, um, uh, five minutes. Um, I, I, I still feel that there is a lot of work to be done on the kind of uh, uh, translation and representation of the intelligence which is often in research by design projects. And I feel it's a kind of uh, um, often mediocre version of architectural representation. That's my feeling. But please, let's have a discussion later on on that. But I, 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 I still see an enormous potential on, uh, on that level. Uh, but again, very good project. Um, other project was, for instance, uh, near the Larbeekbos, uh, where the ring uh, cuts. So this is Zelik, Larbeekbos, ring. 
And the old idea, the very old idea of having, you know, uh, to cover it, to make sure that at least the ecology can continue. The outcome here is that there will be a kind of um, ecoduct um, um, going from A to B. So, didn't work. Um, but again, maybe it's about the visual language because this looks very heroic, kind of. Ta -ta. Maybe we should have opted for something a bit more demure and a bit more uh, uh, understated uh, to make sure that it would come across. And then the last I'm going to show you quickly. Um, uh, uh, this region in Flanders um, is a region which is actually uh, very interesting for uh, uh, deep geothermia. So where you can actually go, this is part of a whole a bigger system uh, in, in Western Europe. <coughs> but deep geothermia, so you go like three, four kilometers uh, deep. And on top of that you have this kind of very, I mean, for instance in Germany they have a lot of uh, these kind of installations. It's still on an uh, experimental kind of level, but again, one of the big, I think, challenges is, well, should this just be infrastructure, like a, f uh, um, a small factory which is standing there, or could it be something else? And on top of that, can it actually also be linked uh, into a network? Um, and the answer is, of course, yes. Also there we made uh, a very, I think, intelligent uh, or, or interesting publication on the potential of the geothermia. And the interesting there th thing there was, again, we knocked or I knocked on uh, on the door of uh, VITO, which is the Flemish Institute for Te Technological Development. And um, they asked me to act because they had a problem with the building. They said, like, Baumeister help us. And they started talking during this uh, uh, meeting about geothermia. And all of a sudden I said, like, well, 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 we'll help you with the building, I mean, but that's maybe not the most important thing that we can do. Maybe we can look together at this uh, deep geothermia. And um, this will be for the next uh, 30 to 40 years. Now they're doing three pilot projects, uh, not within the pilot project uh, uh, trajectory, but three uh, uh, new projects to check whether this kind of energy source can actually, because it's, ex it's potentially extremely green, uh, but whether it could have, because it will have an effect also on the um, um, ecological underlayers, so the, um, and probably some quite uh, uh, deep effects, which we don't know yet. So again, I think we managed to, to slip our foot in between the door very early in the process. Um, in this case, at least, there is no research by design yet, uh, but what's Let's say the big gain is that the, the, the big guys like the Vito, the extremely, the, all of us, I mean, three years ago, they didn't know about the potential of research by design. They didn't know, never heard of it. At least now they heard of it. It probably won't be through the Baumeister, but probably other bodies who will really start to intervene, or maybe private bodies. But at least we initiated them. Um, and uh, let's say almost to finish up, uh, so two, two, three minutes. Uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the forthcoming uh, Baumeister uh, report, which I think is going to be presented at the uh, end of the month. Again, a publication I don't have anything to do with, but uh, I like this quote uh, by Charlotte Geldof, who is actually working within the Ramte Vlaanderen. The Ramte Vlaanderen is the... Uh, Department for Spatial uh, Organization in Flanders, of I mean, which was one of those vertical guys, yeah? and in a way they didn't want to work with us. And for five years, I always again came knocking on their door. We were able people like Charlotte, who are fantastic, they actually engaged themselves within their organization to come to us. Uh, uh, and this was a very, almost a very dangerous decision from their part because all of a sudden they were like trespassing in a way. And Charlotte says um, um, that Laboramte, so, and Laboramte is, is, just to be clear, is a collaboration between Team Las Baumeister and Ramte Vlaanderen. So, so it's on an administrative level, so almost very boring. But it's also at the same time standing outside of the administration. So Laboramte created an environment where we could, outside of the existing uh, administration, we could actually become uh, almost have a kind of autonomous uh, reflection. She calls it a, f a safe haven, so a safe environment. 
I wouldn't choose the same word, but it's interesting that she chooses this word, safe environment where we could explore and be spe speculative. Um, within the Flemish administration, a tradition that never has existed before. I mean, people from the administration saying this, I think we've at least managed to say something. Coming back to uh, this guy, uh, the space producer, um, and, and again, uh, probably it's a completely wrong uh, denomination, but um, what I like about, I mean, this is an architect. And I find this not interesting at all. I think this is like passé, beyond control. Uh, the producer, the idea of the producer, uh, which is a bit more anonym, anonymous, uh, which is also, I mean, this is a, uh, an excerpt from a lecture, just to give you uh, an idea of how long I've been, like, from 2006 at the AA, uh, so the school where I teach now, um, when I was teaching at La Cobre, I think, back then. Um, and it's, it's talking about the producer, that the producer is the one who makes things come together. He's not necessarily the star of the show. He's not solely focused on issues such as authorship and even authenticity. Um, and I call them the space producer being a bridging fi figure, multiple and schizophrenic in its appearances. Um, a very, very bad definition still, back then and even now. But I still believe that, let's say, um, if, we, if we want to have research by design to become a success, I think we should avoid that it is, and probably you won't agree, but I still see research by design as a kind of uh, uh, variation of architectural practice or of urban practice. I think it should become something else, where again this idea of um, egos doesn't play, all these things which actually make, sh make sure that architecture has no more societal impact, we have to m avoid and make sure that uh, uh, research by design becomes something else, uh, something more powerful, impactful, uh, with a lot more uh, urgency. Um, two more slides, and it's hopping, I know, but whatever. Um, I, I hope it, it, it offers some kind of uh, metaphor discussion. This is, this is a diagram from 2014, and in a way it's, it's, at the, it's kind of the basis of my uh, PhD research as well. The intention is actually to try to think about the practice environment of the future, well, of the very near future. The reason why I quit the office two, two years ago was that uh, I don't believe anymore in a kind of uh, architectural practice who, I mean, I still believe in 51 and Farif, to be clear, on a uh, uh, very good company. Um, but um, I don't believe, I mean, the conditions, I mean, let's say all of these practices, not only architectural practices, urban practices, but mainly architectural practices, um, um, the conditions under which they have to work, the nearly zero respect, let's say, societal respect that you get, um, I think it's highly problematic. And I, mean, I, for one, I've decided not, no longer to be interested to be part of such kind of environment. But I do believe that, let's say, with a couple of very intelligent souls, uh, we can establish other types of practice. And uh, if this could be, uh, it's probably not this scheme, huh? but at the moment my imagination doesn't reach further than this. But I think at the middle of this practice should be school. At the moment, school is still a kind of either preparation or something in parallel of practice. And again, if we talk about research by design, I think research by design is school, or should be school, and vice versa. <clears throat> so um, I think we should be able to establish a school environment which is at the center of a practice, uh, which on the one hand side is of course infected by these different architectural practices which come in, go out, come in. So students can actually, they don't have to do, um, uh, what's it called, the, uh, the two years after the five years, the stage. The stage is happening while, you, while, while you're actually studying, so you're, you have to go uh, and work there. Also you will be infected by this policy design, so the pilot project, so designing instruments, because I think research by design has no future if there are no instruments that I can actually allow. Research by design, for me, is not an instrument. It's a tool. 
to uh, arrive at, but an instrument, well, maybe tool and instrument, um, uh, it's not a procedure, to my understanding. A pilot project is a procedure, and it needs research by design to be successful, because a pilot project in itself doesn't mean anything. Um, so this policy design, being able that architects, geographers, um, people who are in the social sciences can actually start also to design procedures. I think that would be a fantastic, uh, yeah, I don't know who, who I'm looking at, but uh, um, it could be a fantastic gamble, I think. And it's a gamble, but I think it's a, uh, so design procedures. And then of course, cultural production, something which doesn't produce any kind of uh, money or budget, but is extremely necessary to communicate because without the cultural production, again, linking back to, for instance, the drawing techniques, uh, I think the cultural production has also has to be uh, reinvented. So this is my, uh, let's say, small thing um, on my wall or at the back of my head. It won't be this for sure, but I can trust, uh, to trust you that, that uh, uh, we have very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, debates going on. And I feel intuitively um, that these components Although, again, they're not spectacular, uh, but are really the ingredients uh, for the near future. Uh, before last slide, this is an article, again, not, not, not to show, the, but um, this is from uh, yesterday in Knack, Knack magazine. It's like, uh, what's it in French? Uh, Le Vif. Le Vif huh? um, and actually, I, I, I did shut up for a year uh, uh, publicly because I had other juridical things to do. Um, but I think it's also important that if you're, if you're engaged within research by design, that you also act publicly and that your research by design, the elements of research or the, the output of research by design, is not your only means to react publicly. You yourself are a person, an intelligent person in your own right, or an organization, intelligence organization. And what I'm extremely lacking is debate. And this is maybe like an open door, but uh, I don't understand why there is no debate. I don't understand why, I mean, again, this is maybe slightly against suicide. Uh, but I mean, this is, for instance, dealing with things like Uplace, with the uh, Antwerp ring, where they're going to try to, with um, uh, the the dossier of the 160 schools they're going to build in 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 Fl or being are being built built in in Flanders through PPP, but knowing that in 25 years time these 160 schools they will be rubbish, and there are no budgets foreseen in 25 years time. So you know the the how PPP works. So the private partner builds it. And then 25 years or 30 years later, the public party, in a way, uh, uh, buys it back. There's going to be a big drama in 25 years in Flanders uh, in schools. And is it my task to say this? No, probably not. But apparently nobody else, in a way, is, is saying it. And the reason why I'm, I'm doing this, for me, this is also almost part of a research attitude and a design attitude. It's not research by design, but it's uh, part of these things. And I feel to be a pity that uh, not a lot of voices are heard because, again, I think there's an incredible intelligence, there's an incredible um, expertise that is here, that is happening within also the academia, but you don't hear them. And for sure, again, probably I will get shit over my head for this, but at the same time, I mean, the Gazette van Antwerpen, so the Antwerp newspaper, took over one quote saying that for um, so the, the whole covering of the ring, I, I told them that this is going, again, this is like uh, holding back the whole population for 150 years. This is, of course, your perfect quote. It's now, we need these kind of things as well. If you want research to be, uh, by design to be urgent, you need these kind of calls, and then you can react with research by design. But this also is needed, I think. And again, f and this is my, my mantra, and also the mantra I want to, I always give to my students. Um, every step that you take, every thought that you have, has to positively uh, 
response to those two things. What kind of impact can it have? And you have to be able to respond, I mean, to have to formulate a, uh, an answer to that. And what kind of urgency does it have? Also there I feel that too much research by design is research by design for the sake of research by design. I think, um, and to be honest, the things I showed you, I mean, I'm not wholly, uh, I think I showed you a lot of things which are not uh, answering these two questions uh, fully. But I think it should be kind of mantra. And if these things impact and urgency always can actually be positively uh, answered, I think the spatial discipline again could gain some societal urgency and can gain some uh, societal impact. Voila, thank you very much.